Welcome, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming out. Uh, this talk is NGRX selectors, or how to not worry about your store structure. Yes. So, hello. I am uh, Todd Motto. I came all the way from England to be here today. And uh, like I said, I'm David East, and I came all the way from uh, Denver. Uh, yeah. One hour flight. It's a big trip. So despite the, the distance between David and I, we've been friends for quite a while. And uh, we were learning NGRX a few years ago together. We jumped on Google Hangouts. We were talking about things. And uh, I actually have a picture of David and I. Yeah, so this is David and I learning NGRX. <laughs> so we weren't really too sure what we were doing. And we're here today to present a few things that we overcame. And the funny thing was, is actually during this time that Todd and I met, I was working on an NGRX app that was in production. And I was like a really big like, uh, champion for using NGRX. I went up to my manager and I told her, I was like, we need to use NGRX. Like, we have all these state changes. And like, NGRX synchronizes state changes. It's going to solve all of our problems. And the funny thing was, is this was actually kind of my first NGRX app. So rather than... Uh, Using it to solve all these problems, I kind of created a lot of problems. And so today we're going to show you a lot of the problems that we ran into and what we used to solve them. So one of the biggest things is the store. And it seems really simple at first. It's this magical object in which I can subscribe from, and then I can get state changes when they update and render it to my view. And it's all kind of simple. Uh, but the big question is, how do I structure this store for an entire application? So you might have a component, and it renders a list of current orders. So the obvious thing you could think is like, OK, well, I'll just take this list of current orders, and I'll make that a custom slice in the store. But then let's say you have another component. And this component is responsible for rendering past orders. So you're like, all right, I guess I'll take that component state, and I'll store that in my store as well. But then I needed to store all orders. And this is where it got kind of weird for me, because I was like, well, if I have current orders and past orders, that's all orders. Uh, I didn't really know what I was doing. So I was like, all right, I'll just store all the orders as a third slice in the store. And at first, the reducer for this was actually kind of easy. It kind of tricked me into following this pattern. And so I would switch on the uh, order load success. And that pretty much would uh, give me some actions over the network. And I would take this array, and I would just start filtering it. So I would get my current orders by just filtering on the is active property. And to get my past orders, I would just invert that. And then I just tack on all my orders. And I thought this was really easy. But then I had to update this data. Yeah, and this isn't the easiest piece. So this is nice and clean, order load success. We end up with three lines of code, and it's, it's a nice space. But when we want to start updating things, we also can create things, we can delete things. So what does it look like? When we want to update, we could do something like this, which isn't, you may not, may not be, able, be able to see it, it's so small. But it takes a lot of code. We've got too many loops. We've got all orders or past orders. We have to manually iterate through everything. We have to detect something that we're trying to change and then rebind it to the state tree. Now, this is just one reducer. So if you imagine you've got 100 reducers, 200 reducers, this is going to spiral out of control. So you may look at your code base, like I have many times, and you come back to your reducer and you think, what is happening? Who even wrote this? So at this point, I was kind of like, maybe we're missing something. What did we miss? So we went back to the drawing board, and we checked out this diagram, the lovely diagram that took me ages to do. So we looked at the diagram, and we, my expectation was I can just dispatch something, put it in my store, and then I get this new state back. But if the problem with this diagram is if you only use these three tools, your actions, your reducer, and your state, you're going to run into the same problems that we ran into. And so Todd and I got to thinking, and we realized that we had to redo this diagram, that we needed to rethink. And we actually, I think Todd stayed up all last night uh, doing this diagram. So you show yes. everyone, Todd? Boop. Yeah. <laughs> Big change. It's so a, selectors are the missing piece. With selectors, we solve all the problems that we ran into before. And you might have seen selectors 
on a tutorial or a video or in documentation, probably not in documentation, but you know, you might have seen it somewhere and, uh, you, and it was communicated to you as, hey, this is an advanced concept or an intermediate concept. You don't need to learn this at first. But Todd and I are here to say that we think that selectors are a fundamental concept of NGRX, that they are, there's not just three circles to NGRX, there's four. And selectors are really, really simple. So you, it's easy to learn them at first because they're just queries to your store. And selectors provide us with a lot of great benefits. Yeah, and the few things that we should ideally look for with these benefits, we get a nice API for composing our view models. We can reduce our action boilerplate, which is a hot topic at the moment. And we can simplify our reducers. And we also have memorization. I think it should be spelled with an S. And we also have the routing state as well. So the routing state we'll come on to. This is my favorite piece. We saved it for the end. So it's actually really easy to refactor your store for selectors as well. So before we had these three slices of state and we were filtering out. And you know what, this is a lot to keep track of. We don't want to do this, so let's just delete them. And instead of keeping track of three pieces of state, I'm going to keep track of one. And like before, when we had to update state, I want to do a uh, order added action. It's really simple. All I have to do is like add a new order. I'm updating one piece of state, not three pieces. Yeah, so we've kind of refactored the uh, the reducer, and we've taken those three slices of state out. Now, we treated those as more of a view model. So how do we actually get the view model? This is where we introduce create feature selector and its sibling create selector. So these are two things that we need to create um, selectors where we can go and compose those view models. So these both come from NGRX store package. You can import both of these. And we can say that we want to create a new reference to this new slice of single slice of state that we have. So we're going to say, give me a feature selector. And we're just going to pass in a string value. Give me that property of orders. Now, the difference between the two is the create feature selector. We have feature modules in Angular. So we have an app module. We might have a lazy, lazy loaded orders module. So the feature selector is for feature modules. It will dynamically bind itself to the state tree. So this is how we can create a reference to it. So once we've got that, we now want to come out of the reducer. We don't want to do any view model stuff in there. We want to compose it here. So we're going to say that we want to get the current orders. So this is how we're going to learn how to compose it. And we can just pass that first selector in as the first argument. We then get a, a function argument. We get the orders given back to us. So this function will get executed. And we can then map over things. We can filter them and we can just return the active items. So this solves that one problem where we have all the current orders. Now this function is called a projector function, and we'll come on to some more complex uses as we continue as well. So we also have the past orders. So how do we get the past orders? We can simply, like we were doing inside of the reducer, we can just invert that expression. So this is nice and clean, and it's nice and simple. And using the selector is uh, really easy to do. All you do is inject the NGRX store into your component. And then what you can do is just use the select method and uh, just pass in your selector, just like that as you would usually use with the select API. And so before, we had three view models sitting in our store. And we switched that to having three selectors. And the really big benefit of these three selectors is that they are reactive. And that's just kind of like a really fancy way of saying, like, I have uh, one component here, my current orders component. It's going to dispatch that a new current item was added. And what that will do is it'll recompute my selectors for any query it matches. So since it's a new item, it'll recompute my selector for getting current orders as well as getting all orders. And in, as you can see, it did not update for getting past orders because it wasn't affected by it. And what's really magical about this is that it's just one update to synchronize multiple pieces of state, rather than managing multiple actions and trying to keep everything in sync in your store. So the issue that we looked at at the beginning was having these initial three arrows where we had three slices of state, and expanding and scaling the store becomes quite challenging. So let's assume that we've got a new requirement, and we, for practical reasons, want to click on an order. So we want to go and get that order by its ID. Now, there's multiple ways that we can do this. 
But let's look at how we could do this with a selector. So this is a slightly different one because we are, as you can see, we have a parameter, we have an ID. So we're expecting to be able to pass something into it and get something back. Now, if we take our initial selector, so a good thing to remember here is that we can reuse these selectors. We can compose them in multiple places. So we can pass in all of our orders, which gives us this back. We can then say, I want to use the array prototype find method, and we're just gonna try and iterate our collection and find that single ID. So this is nice, it's simple, it works, but there's kind of an issue with this. What if we want to render, say, 10,000 items? Wait, why would you need to render 10,000 items? My project manager told me. <laughs> so rather than having to loop through 1,000 items just to retrieve one, we would rather just be able to quickly access one item. And that is something you can do with the entity pattern. And you may have seen in some talks today the NGRX entity library. And we're not gonna dive specifically into that library, but we are gonna show you how it works underneath the hood and how you could actually implement it without using the library. Yes. So this is a really cool piece. And if you're starting with NGRX, then this is a really nice thing to kind of dive into from the get-go. So let's assume we've got three here, but we could assume 10,000. So we've got an array. Now, we've indicated that an array, we have to loop over things, we have to filter, we have to map. And it becomes a challenge just to update something. We have to iterate and replace. So the proposition with an entity pattern is we have these three IDs. We've got one, two, and three. Now, what happens if we flatten these to an object structure? So we take those unique IDs, which ideally would be generated on the server, and then we say object one, give us the order one, and so forth. Now the benefit with this is, we've mentioned arrays are kind of bad, we have to iterate, and if we did have 10,000 items, then doing something like this would not be possible. We'd, we'd have entities, square bracket three, and instantly it gives me that one back. One back. So we have number three. And we could pass in number 10,000 if we wanted to, and it, we get it back as fast as number three. And using the entity pattern in a reducer is actually really easy because it standardizes how we can write it. So right here, we get our orders back as an array. And we don't want this to be an array, we want this to be an object. So this is just like an imaginary flattened method that goes through and turns it into an object. And so now that we have it as entities, we just put it as a property on our state tree. However, we've kind of built our application, we're using ng4s, and changing everything over to an entity pattern immediately breaks everything. So why does it break everything? Don't worry, there's a simple fix. Using selectors, ironically. So we can use our get all of that, our order slice. Now, this is no longer an array. It looks like this. So we're actually having orders, and we want to return that dot entities. So we're just creating one reference to it. Then we can say, okay, because my application's broken, my ng4s aren't working, how do we transform these entities back into an array for a view model. Now we learned that we don't put view models back in the reducer, so this is where we can then compose these. So we can just say object keys, which will give us uh, basically our previous example where we had one, two, and three. And then we iterate those and we return each entity. So we get a brand new array from this. Now the benefit is this is just one data structure. And we're using two selectors. We've got our data in one format, object forms, and we've also got an array form. I've said this. <laughs> there we go. So like Todd said, the entity pattern is really good for fast object lookups. If I can look at something, uh, try to get something that's a 10,000 item in the list, it's just as fast as getting the first item in the list. And it really simplifies our reducers because it gives us a standard way that we can write them and we don't have to worry if we're doing it the wrong way. But where the entity pattern really shines is when you use it with the router. So, with our get order by ID selector, we need an ID to get an order. So it makes sense that if we took a router path of slash order slash one, well that one is the obvious candidate to pass into this ID. So you might be thinking like, okay, I could imagine how we'd do this. So if we have a component, we, uh, we have this order detail component. And so the first thing I'll do is I'll go to my router and I'll get my router state. And so this order ID is the router state, the slash orders slash one. So since I have this ID, I can just select this and put that ID into the selector. Now this is really easy, 
But there is a problem with doing this. And that's because I don't want any routing code in my components. Like, routing code belongs in route guards or resolvers. But the great thing about NGRX is, is that you can actually use routing code with selectors. And this is where the, this is probably my favorite piece, the router store package comes into play. Now you can download this as well, it's available on NPM, and you can get it up and running probably in 20, 20 minutes. Now the benefit to doing this is, one, we remove our routing from the components, but we end up with treating the whole application, not just the Angular logic, but things like the URL bar as this single state tree. So we end up with something like this, where we have the router reducer, and this is given to us for free, and we also have this state property. Now you can populate this state property with anything that is available on the activated root snapshot. So let's assume that we have the URL of orders and we also have this params of one. So we can have slash orders, slash one, and this is just immediately available in the state tree. So taking our get order by ID example, how does this actually benefit us? So let's create a new feature selector. This will be probably in an app module, in the root module. We can create a feature selector, that reference to this router reducer. Now again, this is given to us by the NGRX package, the router store package. Now this is probably the, the mind-blowing bit. It was for me at least. So let's take our entities, so our object structure, which is made up of keys of one and two and three, and we've got that param of one as well. So secondly, we can then say, give me, the, give me the entities and give me the router state, which in our projector function gives them to us in the order that we pass them in. So we have our entities and the router, which the magic, the recipe here, is that we can look up that single entity with there's no loops, it's super fast, and we get that order ID that's available to us on the param. So we can add it in there instantly. Now this, when we navigate away, come back and go to a new component, in the background, the router store package is keeping all of this in sync. So you write this code once and it's there. You don't have to touch it again. And using this in a component, we can go back and refactor it. So we don't need the order ID anymore and we're not calling the selector as a function because it's automatically being handled for us. And what this means is, is that we're, we don't have any routing code in this component. So there's a new recipe for being able to uh, not worry about your store structure. So you wanna follow the entity pattern. Embrace selectors. You wanna avoid view models in your store. And like we've just seen, using them all together with the root estate really improves the state tree and your selectors. So when you're thinking about, well, how do I structure my store? Well, it's not how do you structure it. It's how we ask for it. So the next time you start an NGRX app or you have to go back and refactor a reducer, don't worry about your store structure. Just think selectors first. Thank you. Thank you very much.